صباح الخير جميعا عليكم احنا هنتكلم النهارده بال... بالانجليزي بس ده بينفيت لل... للكونسلتنس اللي معانا عشان ما يفتكروش ان احنا بنتكلم عليهم مثلا ولا حاجه يعني كده يعني سبيكينج ويم از جوينج تو ستارت ويز ذيس تو سلايدز فيرست سو يو وونت مي تو بوت ذيم يس بليز بيكوز اي ستارت ويز ذيم اوكي Good morning, everyone. Uh, we have a very important and very interesting event uh, today. Uh, it, actually, it's, the whole thing is about women empowerment, okay? how we benefit from the half of the population that's really not functioning and not contributing enough to the um, economy. It has been calculated in the case of Egypt, and it was found that if women are to be really involved in the job market, this is going to increase the rate of growth of GDP by something like 30%. The rate of growth will increase by 30%, which is significant, okay? But obviously, in order to do that, we need to know how to do it, because the problems of this country are always related to the how. We always know what we want, we, know, we always know where we're heading, but we don't know how to do it, okay? Towards that, uh, in order to know where to go and in order to know how to do it, we need to benefit from the country's, other countries' experience. No need to reinvent the wheel, which is something also that we have a very high tendency of doing all the time. We always reinvent the wheel as if Egypt is a unique case that has never existed anywhere else. Okay? There is nothing unique about Egypt. Okay? What we need to do for women is not different from what needs to be done for women in other countries in the world. Now, ECS is very much interested in this. Okay, and we um, decided to go for a big project in support uh, uh, of women. Um, divided, the project is divided into two parts. The first part is a study, detailed study, that's trying to capture the maximum possible of international experience, not of success stories for women. Okay, we are not going to say Mrs. X and Mrs. Y did a great job and she's happy and she became rich and all this stuff. We are not doing any of that. What we are doing okay, is, uh, is look at the situation in different countries using the experiences of those women to understand what is the institutional setup in the country, how did the country help those women, what, what kind of incentives were given, what kind of institutional support exists. There are two places in front here. Yeah. Places here. Okay, all right. Uh, so we are after what countries have done in order to make women succeed. What the international community has done in order to make women succeed, not individual success stories. Okay, there is a lot of that that's already known, and it does not help much. It doesn't help except if you know how it was done, not by the women, but rather by the states. So this is what this is all about. Okay. Before uh, I start, uh, by, I present my, my very nice and very respectable panel. Uh, let me say for whoever comes for the first time to ECS, that ECS's strategic direction is exactly this, okay? It's combining economic efficiency with social justice, because we believe very strongly that if you have need, we are talking about, uh, you know, a very weak economy, okay? But if you have only economic efficiency, then you have a strong economy that's benefiting only uh, a few. If you have only social justice, okay, then you are, then you are, I think you need to reverse your too tall. <laughs> your too tall. <laughs> 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 exchange <laughs> <laughs> You manage? Okay. <laughs> لا 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 ترجعيش ورا لا ترجعيش ورا يا بس كيس كيس بس يا رب على طول so we do not want to have just social uh, uh, justice okay and not no efficiency because we would be spreading poverty and this does not help this does not help much what we want is to have a combination of the two and anything that takes us in this direction this is what we do at ECS, and we believe very strongly that we need to look at specifics, we need to look at details in order to talk about specific policy recommendations, in order to give and, and, and make the right policy recommendations that can support uh, our cause. Okay. Having said this, you can, you can put the other cover, let me uh, introduce uh, my panel. First of all, I'm going to introduce 
Miss Nicola Ellerman and Miss Serena Romano, and they are the two co-authors of the study that was commissioned by the ECS in order to understand the international experience. Uh, Ms. Nicola is an international development advisor. She formerly was head of the MENA OECD competitiveness program. She has over a three decade career. She held managerial, technical, coordination, and advisory positions in various regions and in such policy areas as mobilizing foreign investment, fighting corruption and enhancing integrity, private sector development and public-private dialogue. She has outstanding experience and expertise in engaging in policy reforms, building on analytical reviews, that identification of policy challenges and support change through policy recommendations. She is German and holds a master's degree in economics and international finance uh, from Paris. German-French. She's German-French, but her German character is, is stronger than the French character. <laughs> Overriding. <laughs> Overriding. This, this is how she got, you know, commissioned to do the study, all right? It's this German part in her. said, let's go for it, Nicola. She said, I'll go. <laughs> okay. And uh, Miss Serena Romano, uh, who's Italian. Okay, an international gender parity consultant. She has an extensive European experience in the area of legal, regulatory, and antitrust affairs, notably in the banking and telecommunication sectors. She managed innovative international projects at uh, Eurocard, European International, uh, Mobistar, uh, Olivetti, etc. She served as vice chair of the Information Computer Communications Policy Committee. Uh, she is co-founder and currently president of Corente Rosa, a women's advocacy association that promotes women's participation in business, institutions, and politics. Since 2010, Serena Romano manages a consultancy business advising corporations and institutions in the telecommunication, energy, and gender uh, uh, parity sectors. And she is currently leading the project Enhancing EU Communication and Visibility for Supporting Women's Participation in Public Life. And she holds a degree in law from the Université Libre de Brussels. That last uh, project is in Egypt. Yeah, that last project is in Egypt. So that's, this is actually an, a, a plus. So I'm, I'm, I'm very proud that, that, uh, that they are working, they work together on this uh, study, uh, which I'm sure drove them nuts. Okay. <laughs> I drove them nuts as well. That's the whole idea. <laughs> the whole, okay, but the, the, the outcome is actually excellent. On the commentator side, the guys that are supposed to nail them and, and come up with comments and be harsh and everything, we have, uh, uh, we have two. I'm going to start with the lady. Ladies first, my great friend, whose birthday was yesterday, by the way. So happy birthday to Naveen El Tahri. This is Naveen El Tahri. She's the chairperson and managing director of the Delta Shield for Investment. Previously, she worked with various esteemed banks, including the Commercial International Bank, CIB, and Royal Bank of Scotland. She played a role on the Egyptian capital market from an early stage. Niveen became the first lady elected to sit on the board of the Egyptian Stock Exchange for two consecutive terms. Um, she sits on many public and private sector boards. She holds a BSc from the Faculty of Economics and Political Science, Cairo University, and is an alumni of both the Harvard Business School and London Business School. It's a great pleasure and a great honor to have you. Uh, then we have Mr. Muhammad Al Allah, the only male on the panel. Poor guy, poor guy. Yes, they're, they're clapping for you. My goodness, <laughs> you're a victim. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, but you've got you've got guts to be on the panel. <laughs> He's the CEO for Cairo for Investment and Real Estate Development. He's the co-founding partner of Ahead of the Curve. Uh, which is working actually on entrepreneurship, uh, chair of education committee at AmCham Egypt. He's the chief executive officer of Cairo for investment, real estate development, uh, following a 10-year career in the United Nations that focused on development and corporate sustainability. El Qalla founded Ahead of the Curve consultancy, offering technical assistance to the private sector on corporate social responsibility issues. He's a specialist in private sector sustainable development, educational and BOP investment. He's a graduate of the American University in Cairo. He majored in political science with a specialization in international law and a minor in development studies. Started um, 
Um, he started his career in U, you know, UNHCR, moving on to UNV, UNRC, lots of United Nations posts, where he supported the foundation of the Global Compact Network in Egypt and other countries around the MENA uh, region. Okay, thank you very much for being here, both of you, to comment on the paper. Without any further uh, delay, let us please uh, start uh, with the presentation. The whole idea is to talk about what can be done to support women. Uh, I asked actually Nicola and Serena not to spend time on talking about the importance of SMEs, okay, or the importance of entrepreneurship. This is already settled, okay? So we are going to try and go directly into the results, okay, as far as uh, uh, the international experience is concerned, but starting, of course, with some, you know, basic definitions for, you know, what, how they define certain things in order to proceed. So, please. Thank you, Abla. Um, welcome to everybody. I'm very pleased to be here. I've been in Egypt a lot of times. I started working in the MENA region in 2008, 9 so that's a decade ago. And in 2009, I uh, launched a network of women entrepreneurship in which we started to discuss analytical um, elements on driving factors for entrepreneurship in the MENA region. At that time, I didn't meet Abla because Abla, I met her a little later, but I met immediately Naveen El Tari. And um, we initiated a lot of discussions. We, um, the result was the drafting of three books about the region. Um, Naveen inspired us with her experience on access to finance. We launched even a concept that was the missing middle. Nowadays, everybody uses it, in particular the World Bank. We're very proud about that. Um, and I think uh, I left the OECD about a year ago. I met uh, Abla about five years ago on SME development and uh, then uh, at the beginning of the year, she empowered us with this study on women entrepreneurship around the world that was a big challenge because it was not about the region, but it was about what's going on in the rest of the world and how can what happens in the rest of the world um, inspire the region. So we are not uh, working on Egypt, as she said, that might be something that you discuss amongst you and all in the future based on what we found. I'd like to say a special welcome to everybody, but also I'm very pleased to see that ECES has advanced a lot and invited so many men who are willing to come. One man on the panel is excellent, but men in the audience as well. Um, we have found in our work some things that we thought we would knew or we would come across didn't astound us in particular when it comes to access to finance, we will talk about it. But there are things that we have discovered on women behavior that they stay away from mainstreaming um, um, entrepreneurship associations. And uh, the fact that uh, this uh, growth rate that is potentially there, that can potentially be achieved, as Abla was saying, can only be achieved if one does it jointly. We cannot sit the women in one corner and the men in the other, so we necessarily need to link up. So without further ado, what are we going to talk about? Uh, we will say a few words about SME development because I think that even I have always to remember the key facts. We will speak about uh, briefly what are the definitions that are out there and that have led also our approach then uh, what was the project about and what were the challenges that we encountered and what are the results that we have found by going through a variety of policy areas um, and, and some concluding remarks. Now, the economic relevance on SMEs, just to recall, uh, and most of you in the audience will remember, it is about 90% of the business world worldwide. In some countries it's a bit more, in some countries a bit less, but SMEs have really a very big role to play. They represent 50% of employment in general, and they are between 60 and 70% of value added in a country. So you can really not do without them and you need them. Um, they have an absolutely indispensable role when they are uh, moving fast and when they are creative and when they are um, 
um, innovative, so you need them in order to make sure that your economies are competitive. But then they are also sometimes the only source of employment for poorer population, for less well-educated educated population. So they really have a role on both ends of the spectrum. Uh, considering uh, the birth rate and the development in the world, the World Bank estimates that there will be 600 million jobs that will have to be created through SME development by 2030 and I think this is really a very high number and very important. If we don't manage that, uh, that will mean also a lot of stress outside in the roads and, 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 and um, this needs to be addressed. So just a, a, a short overview. SMEs are an engine everywhere, but in regions where they are economic dynamics, such as Asia, SMEs play a much higher role than elsewhere in the world. Um, another characteristic is that um, SMEs, in terms of employment, men and uh, women are almost equal when it comes to self-employment. That is very small companies. But there is a big change when it comes to employment creation by enterprises. And here we see that there is a big gap, that men are creating more jobs uh, men run company, men own company, then women own company. That doesn't mean that women don't create jobs, but just to say that from a general perspective, this is the spectrum. And this will impact also the study that we have been carrying out, the findings that we had. Uh, as a reminder, in economies of low income, most of the SMEs are in the informal sector, and it is progressively um, that the when the economies move to richer situation, better income distribution, that we see that um, SMEs are formalized. So in high income countries, almost all SMEs are uh, formalized and the 11%, I must say, that are informal are very much um, um, self-employed because self-employed statistically remain in the informal statistics. So um, when it comes to SME definition, there is one region in the world that is in the EU, they have started to define what is an SME. That is extreme, they have meant to define it by the number of employees, by the number of turnover and the number of assets. It is very important in order to be able to identify who you talk about, but it is also important in the EU framework because there are lots of regulations and depending on who you are, what size you are, you will have to be uh, um, working in a level playing field with your competitors in countries but also throughout the EU. Um, this definition uh, is not applied everywhere in the world and we did certainly not retain it for our study because it would be, it, 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 we, we, we discovered that it would be very complicated. Our challenge uh, as expressed by ABLA was to go worldwide and to find companies that would respond to our study. So we were very concerned uh, whom we would find. We retained the ILO definition um, because um, the ILO is a little bit more flexible, but what it does, it has uh, tried to identify how to work with companies that move out of the informal sector. Our concern was to report about women working in the formal economy. So we changed a, a definition where businesses are in existence for at least a year. They have at least one um, employment, they uh, work on the way of formalization. Actually, we found companies that were already uh, formalized. And uh, they also seek to have and establish decent work uh, conditions. Um, and that led our approach to the project. Hello, does this work? No, it doesn't. Hello, everybody. Thank you, Abla. Thank you, Nicola. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Um, I will continue. Maybe I will do the th more thanking afterwards. Um, we have looked at this project, I would say, the other way around. We wanted to see what was, what is it that makes somebody or a company successful? Why is it successful? Because there is a measure behind it, because there is a support behind it. So looking at it, uh, we went, we found the companies, 
we identify them and we analyze the measures, whether they be government measures, whether they be associations, whether they be donors, that help them go forward, that help them to uh, develop. And we did a, an in-depth, time-consuming uh, work to find these companies. It is very difficult to find women-led companies of a medium size, because we wanted companies, in fact, that were growing. We wanted to see what was making them grow. So this was difficult to find, and we suddenly realized that this was due to the fact that women are difficult to find generally. They're invisible. So they, this will be reflected throughout the study, and the consequences of this sort of invisibility uh, is very important to analyze. So what we did is we sent a questionnaire to a large number of entrepreneurs, uh, women, and, and, and tried to find somebody who accepted to speak to us, which we did in the end. And we covered, in fact, 15 different policy areas that we're going to talk about to, to analyze in which areas they, um, they most uh, worked upon and which were the most important ones for them. Now, these are the uh, countries and the companies, the sectors that we covered. We had two in France, in communication and technology, one consultancy. In India, there is a fantastic online marketing platform that we shall analyze. In Indonesia, we're talking about cooperation that develops uh, retail activities of different kinds. In Ireland, we have this extraordinary um, uh, engineer woman who has developed and, sail and sells mobile applications for privacy. In Japan, we have this uh, export company who does also brand marketing. Uh, in Lebanon, uh, a lady who is leading access to finance. In Malaysia, we have different companies that are doing peer-to-peer -peer financing. In Mexico, an extraordinary marketing and communications lady, very dynamic and, by the way, very similar to the Japanese one. Uh, in Mexico, real estate again. Mexico again, real estate. Um, in Morocco, this import-export for agribusiness. And in the Philippines, uh, she's doing coffee, by the way. We will talk about this. This lady is importing Italian coffee, Lavazza coffee. Uh, in the Philippines, uh, a farmer who has inherited land and she's doing uh, agriculture, she's doing a restaurant, she's doing handicraft. In the land in Netherlands, an executive coach who is actually coaching women um, and she's coaching them also in the US. Uh, Tunisia plastic extrusion, a lady uh, creating plastic bags. In Turkey, a very fine insurance broker for the um, construction companies uh, particularly. And in Zambia, two extremely dynamic uh, ladies, one in uh, agro-processing and the other in manufacturing of clothing. Um, yes, the results. You want to go back to the different parts? So I think what, what comes out is that you see that we have no homogeneity. We didn't tap into one single network. Uh, we have found a variety of women with various jobs, with various experiences in various countries. And um, I think uh, that this variety could have left le led us to um, having the impression that we find nothing in common or that uh, they are all different and that the regional differences would have a much stronger impact than what we actually found. We find a lot of similarity despite the fact that these businesses, some are very young, some are very old. Some, they have all different legal status, they're in different sectors. So um, what we try to do is to, uh, um, before we started to talk to the ladies, uh, because this would have been just uh, in a big disorder, we tried to put our um, ideas uh, together. And uh, we ordered them to some extent in something that has um, come out just now and uh, two months ago by the OECD. I was saying to Abla, this is a publication in the OECD, unfortunately mentions not by a word gender. 
but it's almost 400 pages long and uh, in A4, so heavy in terms of analytics. And um, I think what it shows is that there are many elements that need to be put together in order for economies to be well functioning for entrepreneurship development. We know, we've heard entrepreneurship development will be important to create jobs, it is important for creating competitive economies, and there is probably not a single element that you can work on. You will have to be working on a variety of issues. When you take the business environment, you will have to work on a whole set of institutional and regulatory elements that have to be put in place and function well together in order to create a dynamic market in which to operate. But then there is the market conditions per se that will determine how is your domestic market functioning and how are you working in the global economy because today, without the global economy, Economy, nothing is possible and in order to reach the global economy you have to put into place a number of factors that are called infrastructure but infrastructure today covers a wide variety of elements we will see and then there is the whole issue of how do you finance stock, um, enterprises from the beginning over its lifetime to the end and there are different ways of doing that and Naveen will be here to discuss that access to skills access to skills by the entrepreneurs access to skills of their employees and this today is moving fast so you cannot continue having your skills from 20 years ago you have to train constantly and young enterprises or small enterprises have much bigger difficulties to having access to skills and eventually in the times of artificial intelligence what it does it mean to have access to innovations access to the right techniques in order for a company to grow so uh, these were the challenges that we reviewed yeah. so what were in what can be defined as policies that can influence company development we have identified 14 different ones plus something that has been identified by the entrepreneurs. And if you look at the left column and the right column, you will see that, in fact, you will understand as we go through each of them that they have been um, analyzed and we've seen results which are very different. When we talk about BDSs, we talk about infrastructure, access to finance, all these issues are issues that women are involved in, the ones that we have interviewed. Human capital, of course, the importance of the national business climate, the importance of competition and public governments, the impact of taxation. This is, we will analyze this in depth. On the, uh, on the right-hand side, however, we have found a sort of reluctance, a difficulty for the women to get involved in national or international sector-specific actions. Third-party investment, difficult to seize a part of their capital. Access to knowledge, again, some difficulties. Public procurement and absolutely nothing. In, in involvement into a supply chain, very difficult. And network engagement is something that they do, but maybe not in, at a higher level. And finally, uh, involvement in public-private uh, dialogue. I think that we have identified one entrepreneur who was involved. So we will skip, and uh, we won't skip, but we will analyze the first part more in depth, and the rest we will go faster. Nicole, you want to go into the yeah. Yeah. So um, business development services um, is for us something that is something very horizontal. Uh, it belongs into access to knowledge, access to information on markets, access on regulation, access on um, finance. So we have put it above everything as a transfer uh, transversal support. Uh, it can be, it is something that c is strategic in the medium term for an enterprise development and it can be very operational. Um, it is um, to be improving the SME performance, it is in order to have growth in um, companies and uh, it helps also to reduce poverty, the whole spectrum that SME development is important for. Um, 
it can be provided by many, and uh, this stuck me when I came to Egypt first in 2009. There are many BDS providers. They're public, they're private, they can be semi-public. They can be lodged in universities. They can be provided by NGOs. Um, and uh, one subset in um, BDS is that they provide incubators. And uh, what we have found, and that's very important for me as a revelation, is that even in OECD context now, um, there is a concern that in order to support women entrepreneurship, there should be women dedicated business incubators. This has not been the case when we started 10 years ago because we were ambivalent about it. We said, no, we would have to have BDS and incubators for men and women alike. People were shying away. Now these days, even OECD says in OECD countries, in order to support SME development, we need uh, women dedicated business incubators. And uh, we we want to report, in our report, we, we, we re relate one case that is in French uh, institution that is uh, entirely voluntarily, they're very clever, they have uh, established good contacts with bankers and government institutions, but they're women-led. They've been created in 2005 and uh, they accompany the women in many different ways in giving them um, support in small classes, in longer coachings and in yearly events, they have an incubator um, in which they, uh, women-led uh, companies can be established and remain for a while until they're able to, to leave. Um, they have had high success rate with over eight, 800, uh, almost 900 projects, uh, creation of uh, three, uh, supporting of 3,000 entrepreneurs and creating net 2,000 jobs. Um, and uh, now they have uh, la just launched an incubator in Saint-Denis, which is one of the most poor suburbs of Paris, and they're now moving from more uh, educated women into uh, the more difficult areas, and they hope to have successful we will, uh, rates. We will be able to talk about that in a year or two. Yes, I think that they started in Paris and then they spread out throughout France. They also have, uh, they're also in Morocco, and they had a great support from this town of Paris. So it, it, th there is a support from, from, from government, which should be mentioned in, in recommendations. So we are going to sort of give you the measures, the results, and the recommendations. It is only a flavor of the recommendations that are in the study. Uh, those have to be, of course, much more detailed. So we, we're just giving you a little bit of uh, what we think that could be done. Um, it is obvious that, as Nicola was saying, the BDSs have to be gender sensitive. Um, it's not going to happen by itself that women come. So you have to go and make an effort to ensure that women are involved. And in order to favor the creation of these incubators, again, they have to be gender sensitive. That This element has, is, is fundamental. Uh, one way of increasing the visibility of women, this is, this is going to be a theme throughout uh, the, the presentation that we are making, the visibility has to come out. You have to talk about women. And one way of doing it is to create a price of excellence. So if there are incubators, and if one of them is particularly successful, convoke the media, bring the Minister of uh, Industry, uh, Infrastructure, because it's, it's ministers that we are going to gather the media and, and, and you know, create this empathy, this momentum around women so that other women will come up. Um, in addition, of course, there is infrastructure and um, in our initial questionnaire, the question of infrastructure was not at the beginning, but we moved it upscale. Um, infrastructure, you can see, is uh, composed of uh, roads, transportation services, the different sorts of ports, uh, airports, uh, maritime ports. Um, it also comprises ICT, energy delivery, and constant uh, energy access. Um, and this infrastructure not only has to work by itself, it also has to work all together. And this is a key concern in OECD countries as well. In a just-in-time economy, everything has to flow quickly and fast from one point to the next. So all these elements have to be in place, and plus they have to be operational together. What we see in our 
um, questionnaire is that infrastructure is important for everybody, but probably more important for women. If the infrastructure is deficient, it will have high impacts on women's access to the workplace. Um, it will have high impact on their employees to work with them. And if there is security issues or if the, the, the way is too long, uh, they may actually drop the idea of entrepreneurship. So um, we think that there is a key concern to be put in infrastructure and that those who are in charge of infrastructure need to really take that into account and probably discuss with women. It also has an impact obviously on public procurement and on government budgeting. Um, but there needs to be lightning, there needs to be security um, and not only in the transportation but in the overall system and accessibility, and women are more attached to things going fast because they also have other sorts of obligations than men. Um, so uh, what we heard uh, when we were in, uh, um, when we initiated this whole work that was actually at an event in Egypt uh, that organized by Yomna Sharidi, there was an Indian woman talking to us about what they have done in India. Um, Modi, uh, uh, as Indian president, is very concerned to uh, lob freak, I think, India and bring it forward a lot and maybe even to um, uh, demonetarize the economy. Uh, so with this concern in mind, he's also creating Digital India. With Digital India, he hopes to give access to uh, the whole of the economy uh, to a better functioning economy with more access to information, more access to resources. And uh, in India, they created for women specifically with the support of the Min Minister of Women Affairs, a platform through which uh, women, including in very rural areas, can sell their products and put it on the market. And uh, the sales are being done with uh, the computer system and telephones only. So it is almost demonetarized. Um, the only important element is to have access to uh, the postal office. You want to talk about the recommendations? Yeah. Yes. Um, I think that there is a, a strategic role in, in reinforcing here uh, the uh, public-private dialogue and the, the partnerships uh, in support of infrastructure development uh, because it only can work if the women are involved in this discussion. Uh, they're never involved. When, when, when infrastructure is created, when you build a bridge, you don't ask women whether they're going to cross the bridge or not. So th this is an extreme example to sort of uh, understand that um, infrastructure is very much a men's world. Um, so we need to engage in a full government approach which involves, of course, the ministers, the departments and agencies with this view of involving gender and economic experts. And at the same time, um, I think that we, we business women have to be engaged and they have to have the opportunity to let people know what their needs are. And to be able to understand those needs is, is something that will change the type of infrastructure of a country. Yes, access to finance. Surprise, surprise, this is the biggest issue. Uh, everywhere in the world um, and in very many different ways. I think we have spent a lot of time on, in it on the study. Um, access to finance is critical for business, obviously, uh, to fulfill the potential to innovate, to grow and to create jobs. Small firms, uh, we have seen from women that they will not go for, for loans generally. Um, unless they have guarantees. Now, if they have guarantees, which does not o often happen, then they have the opportunity of having, of asking a bank loan and obtaining it. Very small companies, as we know, will go for, for microfinance, and this is the only opportunity that they have when they do not have a collateral. 
what we have seen is that almost all the women in our study experienced difficulties in accessing finance. So the uh, one uh, example that we want to highlight here, there are others in the study, is the one from Morocco, which uh, created in 2013 a Caisse Centrale de Garantie, uh, which la was launched with the Ministry of Economy and Finance, and they created this guarantee called Towards You. Um, the guarantee, in fact, for women covers 80% of the loan. For men, it's 50%. So it's what, what we call, uh, in our jargon, a, disc a positive discrimination. So you are, you're taking women, you're discriminating them, yes, but positively, because there is a recognition by the state that there is another discrimination which is not positive, which is happening to them, and to counterbalance it. Um, so I think that it has th this has helped about 50 businesses uh, within the first year. Now the uh, examples that we have uh, brought to you are two examples which are totally different. Now the first one is from Zambia. The, the name of the company is called Queen of Shitenge. This is this lady that you see on the right. She was here three weeks ago in uh, Morocco, in, sorry, in Egypt, in Cairo. And she was with this gentleman who is called Annie El Behraini. You, I don't know if you know him. And he, the, he was, uh, in fact, organizing uh, this ma ma mega show. Now, this woman has incorporated her company, I think, about two years ago. So it's, it's actually, it's a business. And she was invited by the Zambian Federation of Women in Business to take part in the Women in Financial Inclusion training. She was asked to pitch her, um, her business uh, with representatives from banks, representatives from major companies, and she obtained a grant. She obtained the grant that she needed to move away from her living room and to create a factory. And now she has learned to pitch from women bankers, and she reckons that the grant has in fact incited her uh, to scale up her business. And she has said this fabulous thing that she said to me. She said, you know, there are many tailors that are in Zambia, but I want to be a businesswoman. So the measure is this grant. She was identified as being capable. And now she's, she's going into these uh, international shows. So a lovely lady. Completely different example, access to finance uh, in Ireland. This lady is Italian. She has worked 25 years for a major ICT company. And she decided to launch Ernie app, which is this app that you can have on your mobile phone to evaluate the privacy settings of other uh, major social networks. So you, you see how much you, can, you are protected or not protected. And then she advises you on how to protect yourself. This uh, lady injected the first seed uh, investment to develop the prototype for her mobile application, and she obtained then a debt capital from angel investors from the USA and other, country, and other continents. She reckons the process is very complicated. It is because she is such an expert in ICT that she was able to do it. She says, specific business skills are needed and women need to acquire a, a web of contacts in order to be able to do that. But they can be trained. Women can be trained and coached to do it because those needs, can, those specific requirements can be, uh, you, you can learn them. And they, you know, women can be bold enough to be able to impose on investors which are very difficult to, uh, to understand, to, to grant money to women in general. So, the recommendations, are you doing them? Yeah. I'm doing them and continue to speak. So the recommendation is for policymakers to increase the credit lines uh, through commercial banks and support training and gender. So they have to think that when they are doing credit lines, those credit lines are not just for men, they're also for women. Um, which through mainstreaming programs, identify the most promising businesses, it's not easy, and sectors, including the small ones, and monitor them and ensure that they receive the services. And then finally, regulate and monitor the activity of the microcredit agencies because we understand that they have excessive rates and they can, in fact, um, be very difficult uh, for women to address. 
for lenders, uh, lenders have to understand new forms of businesses and adapt their offers. Um, gender mainstreaming access into finance is important. Uh, removing the bias and hiring, if necessary, women employees to talk to other women. It's sometimes easier. And of course, on the other side, women have to be trained. Women have to be able to address um, lenders and pitch their business. Yeah, I think uh, I just want to add, We uh, in Lebanon, we uh, discussed with the BLC Bank, who led us to an entrepreneur who was actually a jeweler. And the BLC Bank does these annual rewards, visibility, press, etc. So there are good examples. In France, we have the same thing since 10 years. We give out prices with the BNP on women-run companies that far better than the average SME. And yet, women are not necessarily known. And yet, we heard last week that only 3% of startup money goes into women-led companies in France, which is absolutely horrendous. So there is a real need to discuss this. Now, I know that time is playing against us. Our study is very long. We will accelerate a bit from here on. Um, when it comes to human capital and skills development, something very important is not only, of course, the initial education, but also the lifelong training um, and uh, the access for the entrepreneur to knowledge, entrepreneurship skills, and then for themselves, their employees need skills. We have learned worldwide that um, SMEs have far less access to well-trained staff. And we have seen in our examples that all the entrepreneurs had almost um, prior experience to engaging into entrepreneurship. I think it is very important because these days we think that young people will come out of university and create a company. Some may, may succeed, but it is not an easy thing to have access to networks, to knowledge, to everything that you need in order to be an effective entrepreneur. So our entrepreneurs had all excellent education and had long life work experience before they started. They put a lot of dedication to their staff and training their staff throughout. Many also then said our stress factor is that our staff then leaves when they're very well trained. So how do you retain staff? And um, so uh, what they said was as most as ex important as access to finance was team building. The most, the best a company will be run and work if there is team building. That was the great concern. We came across a woman in the Philippines. There was a big project in the Philippines that was led by the government, but also by the private sector. They identify um, skilled entrepreneurs, and then they take them a step further by training them, by giving them support, by branding them, etc. Um, Serena fell in love with uh, this entrepreneur. DBDDB, <laughs> the farm. You can follow her on Instagram. Uh, this uh, absolutely charming lady started by inheriting land from her mother, and she started doing a vegetable farm. Then she launched a cafe and a restaurant, and now she's embroidering um, bags, the bags that you see there. It's interesting that, in fact, she received the, the, from, from this uh, Great Women project a training um, from an international designer. So that made her um, work scale up. She could scale up because of that measure, that capacity. She now has uh, 50 women embroiders, and she has trained them. She works with them, and from, they, they work from home. So they are not hired employees. They are paid by each piece that they produce, and they have access. They, she has created access to a small fund from which they can borrow without interest. And she trains them also uh, to save and to open an account uh, in, in a cooperative. So there is this part of, of, of training of your staff of taking, sh making sure that uh, they are um, they are saving and, and, and they have a future with their family. The recommendations that we are saying on, on human capital is to reduce the cost of hiring and retaining staff, uh, to target women in programs that acquire and develop the skills needed to launch 
and to run a, uh, a business and to support women to harness uh, the economic opportunities of ICT and STEM skills because this is going to give an accelerator to your, uh, to your work. And then assign some cost of training to SME employees to this, uh, by the state to others or other stakeholders because in fact um, it is very, very time consuming and very difficult to train your employees. If a part of this can be taken in charge by a state or by other stakeholders like trade unions for instance, this could alleviate SME development. So here now we reach the session where the women were, first of all, I think it is something that is for men and women, the institutional setup, but um, where we feel that progressively the women were more distant from uh, the overall economy. The women are very much embedded in their jobs, in their businesses, in their communities, in giving back. And yet when it comes to the more macroeconomic environment, they were more at an arm's length. So we take here the national business climb, the, the institutional regulatory framework you see is composed of regulation, taxation, competition, uh, land ownership and tilting, public governance. So there are a number of factors that come into, con into consideration. When it comes to the na national business climate, for everybody who's worked on enterprise development knows that the national business climate is a key component, that it is very important that regulation are transparent, that they're easy, that you can move in and that you can move out easily of a business. The women in, the D in OECD countries were telling us that they considered that over time the business climate has substantially improved in as much as it is much more easy to register a company, to move in, to move out, etc. However, they say that the overall regulation, because there are more and more regulation on a number of elements, is become more complex and retains a lot of work of them and takes away a lot of productivity and sometimes they have to recruit special um, people for that. In developing countries, um, uh, the, the entrepreneurs felt that the regulatory environment is extremely complicated sometimes, and they bluntly said that they are willing to work around, uh, in order to exist, they have to work around some of the very harsh and difficult regulations. Um, everybody wished um, that uh, this uh, would be um, easier. Um, and then, um, of course, a very no, um, in terms of um, competition, very interesting. It is a very important aspect of work, a le having a level playing field so that companies can move in, so that companies can operate and, and, and be competitive. Um, most of the women were concerned that there was not enough competition in their countries. Um, they felt that there would be much more space to have far more women entrepreneurs working in each of the sectors. And interestingly, all the women entrepreneurs said the same thing. Um, in developing countries, we would say that public governance was identified as a real issue. Uh, issues such as integrity, uh, uh, corruption uh, came up in various discussions. Um, in OECD countries, the ladies said that public governance could be enhanced by um, having more data collection, by working more on what is happening on women entrepreneurship and how to improve women, govern, um, uh, women entrepreneurship through government action. Um, so uh, I think that what came out very much in terms of regulation was to make uh, the registration process far easier uh, faster, and of course, um, Serena always insisted on the e-governance um, needs and possibility these days. So no need to, to interact with uh, public officials who make your life difficult and in different uh, setups. You can go to a one-stop shop, uh, one -stop shop uh, electronically. Um, and then uh, creating uh, these uh, opportunities for registering um, and offer administrative services once you identify the women and you can reach out to them. Um, Do you get it? Women entrepreneurs are also often mothers, so I think that it is important to address the issue of nurseries, or at least the support 
in order to ensure that they can uh, uh, be mothers and entrepreneurs. Nurseries uh, should not be uh, necessarily paid by the companies. Nurseries should be taken in charge by the state because uh, children are the future of a company, uh, of a country. So it's important that uh, the country recognizes that and alleviates that burden uh, for women and for men, because also men are fathers. Market conditions. Um, the ladies were in their businesses, working on their markets, be they domestic or be they international. For us, what was important was to see if they have the impression that they were supported in uh, the market development. Also because before leaving the OECD, I did a study on mainstreaming women in trade and investment. Uh, and um, what has come out of preliminary studies is that there is market liberalization when it comes to trade or to investment that are mostly those in which men operate. So women-led sectors are not liberated. Is it that they're not part of the discussions? Is it that they're part of the negotiations? However, this intellectual approach was not found in our study in as much as they were just feeling that, well, sometimes it was easy, sometimes it was more difficult, but they hadn't reflected on that. So I think this is more of an analytical element that needs to be examined together on a macro level and then to see what sort of support can one give so women to have adequate um, access uh, to, to markets. Third-party investments, Serena was saying it, Third party investment is debt. Um, you, you sell part of your business to somebody who gets shares in your business. You lose a bit of your uh, autonomy by selling part of your business, uh, but it is a way to accessing finance. Uh, the ladies that we interviewed had sometimes come across the offer of someone who wanted to invest in their business, none of them actually wanted a foreign investor. Uh, they said maybe this is something that they will keep for the future, but they wanted to be alone in running their company. Sometimes they had partners that were their family members, so they wanted nobody in their business. Um, and they were not really considering this as, a, as an opportunity. Um, public procurement is a very, very important element uh, from a macro point of view. You know that there is over 13%, 1, 3% of GDP that is spent on public procurement. Public procurement is also an area, uh, so it is very strategic, uh, but it is also an area that can be very distorted. Uh, I've been working over 20 years on fighting corruption, uh, one of the most corruption-prone areas in the economy is obviously public procurement. Now, it, it is guiding a little bit our thinking in as much as in public procurement, there is no women, there is no women in selecting the projects, there is no women participating in the procurement offer. The women that we interviewed all said, public procurement is too heavy for us to engage in, public procurement is not a place where we go because we also know that the decision making is distorted. So if women are away from public procurement and if there is no gender sensitive budgeting, you see that the economy is a bit um, going into a direction that serves probably only a few. And then you add the issue of infrastructure that we discussed early on and you see that here we have a, a, a serious issue on which to work. Um, finally, supply chains, supply chains and clusters are nowadays so important. Um, for the development and the competitiveness of businesses and of the economy. Uh, interestingly, the women that we interviewed all kept uh, away from uh, supply chains. Some of them had uh, been approached by it, some of them had made a test, but they felt that it was not fair trading, and so they, 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 kept, they kept away. Recommendations. Um, I think this, the, these recommendations cover the different sectors. We're just going to select a few. Um, the fact that women are involved in international trade is very important. It is very costly for them. Um, I think that they, they, they should be grouped and helped to, to, to be able to participate and invest in there. 
Uh, you need to understand the links between trade and investment and liberalization. This was what Nicola was saying. Um, at the same time, you need to identify and put in place a mechanism that promote women that wish to export. Um, women that are working in, in different environments that we have seen remain within their, their country. Uh, it is a possibility for them to export, but they have to be helped uh, and support uh, and supported. Yes, um, the, there is also uh, the idea that women investors and advisors um, should know about how to be able to seed and, and, and sell their capital. Maybe they are not interested, but the opportunities uh, should be raised. And, and, I th and in fact, um, in order to do that, very often it is useful to have uh, women-focused venture capital investment. So the, 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 the investors uh, are other women. And, and this is uh, coming through in a few examples that we have seen uh, in the UK in particular. And generally, I think the issue of supply chains is an opportunity for women that have small and medium-sized companies. Um, it is important to monitor that for, 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 for governments, to be able to see that th these supply chains exist, to advise and to train women on how to apply to them, and, and maybe find ways in which they can be involved. Access to innovation, access very quickly, um, it is concerns data, research and development, technology. These were not issues that were really um, so much on the radar screen of the women. However, what came out was very much a discussion about networks. What we found is that um, uh, women in uh, the world are very much plugged into networks and uh, the networks that they are in are mostly uh, women-led networks. Uh, they go there into these networks to do B2B, but also to feel good, to have uh, a sense of friendship. However, what we have learned is that um, they're not part of the public-private dialogue in a larger sense. So th what that means is that these th women networks are not plugged into the mainstream networks. What does that mean transposed into Egypt? For instance, they're not part of the e Egyptian Federation of Industry, would be an analogy, or they're not really part of the EGB. And the issues that are of concern to them are not part of uh, the discussion when it goes about discussing with governments what should be done, what should be changed, what should be led. One or two had some input on that. Yeah, the Turkish, uh, the Turkish entrepreneur, yes. Uh, so when it comes to um, access to innovation assets, um, there are lots of recommendations that we made in our report. But I think in order to come to a conclusion and also let you the time to debate what we have presented to you, is to say we need to find worldwide probably an opportunity to bringing women closer to the public-private dialogue and explain well why is it that it is important that in one engages in public-private dialogue, that one believes in public dialogue, the one that was involved said sometimes it's useless, it will take a long time, but eventually it will be heard. So this is the attitude overall, develop public-private dialogue and have everybody represented. And I think with this we want to stop here and, and give you the opportunity to discuss. You don't want to give the conclusion?